So, hello again. We've reached the end of the week. It's Friday. Uh, you know, I didn't have to check my notes for this one today. Um, today we're going to be looking at Mahinda's War. This is my latest book, uh, literally just come out. In fact, I only got these copies last week. Um, very simple story. It, like now or never, it's about uh, unheard voices who were part of the war effort for Great Britain. Um, during World War II. In this case, a man who flew with the RAF called Mahinda Singh Puji. Now, Mahinda Singh Puji, his story isn't particularly well known. There is a statue to him, a memorial, um, in Gravesend in Kent after the war. He settled in Kent, in Gravesend, and he has many descendants there. Um, and the town honoured him as a hero. But generally, people don't know his story. The BBC did do a documentary a few years ago, like a regional one, um, a friend of mine worked on, but mostly people don't know his name. There were lots of pilots, lots of soldiers, as I said, on uh, Tuesday with Now or Never, who came from the empire, from what used to be called colonies, the former colonies now, and they came and they sacrificed and they gave their all for the war effort. What I wanted to do was take Mahinda Singh Puji's story, but rather than just rewrite it, I wanted to write a fictional World War II adventure story, again, like the ones I used to read when I was a kid, but with a Sikh character. Um, I come from a Sikh family, so my mum is a Sikh. I'm not particularly religious, but uh, so the, the, the sort of the idea of a man in a turban with a beard is something I understand. That's my granddad and many of my uncles, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I wanted to create a story with that character in, but the story is actually narrated by a young French girl called Joelle, whose mother is English and her father is French. And when Mahinda crashes in France, she finds him and she rescues him. They, her and her family hide him because they are secretly working for the French resistance against the Nazi occupation. Now the Nazis have overrun France. They've taken over most of the central to the Northern parts. Um, so in a way, this book kind of extends on a little bit later than um, Now or Never, which is at Dunkirk, early uh, 1940. So what you've got is you've got um, almost a continuation. It's kind of like, it's not a sequel or anything. It's two different companies, two different stories, but it's a very similar thing. Uh, I'm very proud of the book. Again, the research was amazingly, amazingly fun to do and also quite scary. Um, and it's going to tie into the task I'm going to set for you today. Now, Joelle is young. She's, you know, uh, key stage three, so she's sort of 12, 13 years old. I can't actually remember, even though I wrote the story. I think she's about 11 or th maybe 13. Um, and I'm going to read you a little passage about her, her resistance activity as a child, and then we're going to talk about the task, okay? There was another route through the fields and around the German checkpoint, but the ground was rutted and uneven and my bicycle would not make it. I also had the option to ditch my contraband, but that wouldn't be ideal either. I stopped, dismounted, and pretended to check my bicycle's chain. All the while, I was watching the checkpoint to see what they were searching for. One or two Germans searched people's bags and belongings, but most were simply asking them questions. I guessed that they were still hunting for Mo, and with my courage replenished, I set off again. You're just a schoolgirl trying to get home, I told myself, over and over. Just a schoolgirl. They won't stop a little girl. As I drew towards the checkpoint, a young dark-haired soldier held up his hand. He spoke in broken and poor French. Please stop, he told me. What are you going? Where are you going? I pointed into town. My house, I replied. I live on the far side, sir. The German soldier nodded. And what are you carrying? I shook my head, trying to avoid his gaze and thinking furiously, about what I would say next. I could not let him find my smuggled goods. Well, he asked, as an idea took shape in my head. I would call his bluff and see if he wanted to touch and smell some rotten vegetables. Just some books and some old onions, I told him, hoping my plan would work. Onions? I nodded. I found them by the roadside, I lied. Please, sir, my man can make soup out of them. Please show me, he said. I got off and opened both panniers on my bike and the stench of the rotten onions rose from them immediately. The German swore in his own language. Enough, he said in French. This is disgusting. I shrugged. 
We might be able to rescue one or two, sir, I lied. Enough to eat, perhaps? He waved me away, shaking his head, and, I call, and called me a pitiful creature. I waited until I was clear before grinning, satisfied and proud that I'd fooled him. Now, Joelle takes great pleasure in fighting with the resistance, working with the resistance, doing whatever she can to thwart the Nazi German occupation. Um, hiding Mo is one of those things. Her family already hides two other men when Mo appears, or Mohammed, we call him Mo, in, uh, sorry, Mahinda, going back to now or never then. So Mahinda, uh, his name is short to Mo, they call him Mo, and they hide him and they need to move him before the Germans discover him. So the Germans are tearing up the town in which they live, um, searching it to find this RAF airman that they know has crashed because they found the plane. And it leads, in the end, to adventure, to danger, uh, to tragedy. It's a very, very simple um, World War II story. And again, the difference with mine is that this one of the central characters the person who the story is based around, not the narrator, but the person whose story is based around, okay, happens to be a Sikh man with a turban and a beard. Um, and that's something that doesn't really happen with these stories. Now, for your task, I'm mindful of the time, for your task, what we're going to do is we're going to look at dealing with change. Now, this is a very thought-provoking exercise. This is not an exercise that I, I, I know it's not easy. It's not an exercise that is particularly about fantasy or fun. What I thought and what your teacher and I sort of discussed was it would be good to maybe talk about coping with change, dealing with change. We are at the tail end of a lockdown in Leicester. We've had a second one. It's had a massive impact on everybody, particularly young people. I know it's had a huge impact on my seven-year-old um, and also my 20-year-old. Um, so what I'd like you to do for this final task of the week is a little bit of mindfulness. We're going to think about our own headspace. We're going to think about how we feel. Um, so heart space, head space, how we feel, what we think about the situation that we found ourselves in. So how has your, how have you processed lockdown? How's lockdown worked for you? Have you been out walking with your sort of family? Have you sort of seen your friends at long distance? Maybe you've been a little bit naughty and met up with friends when you shouldn't have done. I don't know. What we'd like you to do is explore your own emotions, your own feelings, your own thoughts about where we've been, where we are now, but also to make it hopeful. Where do you hope to go? Where do you hope to be in three months time, in six months time? What are the things that you missed? What are the things that have changed in your life over the last few months that have made things a little bit more difficult? And more importantly, what is it that you haven't done that you've maybe realized like a lot of adults that you really don't miss like i really don't miss shopping i mean i go shopping and you sit there and you think well you know food shopping's different but i've realized personally that over the last few months there's a lots of things that i don't need that i don't that aren't important to my life that don't actually help in any way you know they're just possessions they don't really matter and that what matters is family it's my kids it's it's your friends it's keeping in touch albeit socially distanced with the people that matter to you this is all stuff that i want you to explore it's not easy it's not um particularly sort of i don't know like you know dancing around blah 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 but what i'd like you to do is to give it a go again not very long um a passage um you know three four five paragraphs maybe nothing more than that really or a poem in fact, what I'd really like to see is some poems. Um, I'm a big fan of poetry. Uh, not the always easiest thing to write, but don't worry about that. You know, poetry is poetry. Just give it a go. Um, have fun with it. It's been wonderful um, to work with you. Sorry, I keep looking at the time. It's been wonderful um, to work with you this week. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope you've had a really good time all the way through. Um, take care. And if I'm ever in your school um, at some point in the future, um, Make sure you come and say hello, because obviously, I, you know, I can't see you. Um, you can come and say, well, I was sitting watching these videos and your office is a mess. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you very much. Take care and I'll see you soon. Hopefully. Bye.